Hello, everyone. Welcome to HuffPost live event on parenting during COVID-19, the second of three virtual events on parenting. Tonight, we'll be discussing how to get your kids emotionally prepared for school in all of its forms with psychologist Dr. Becky Kennedy. I'm Lauren Moraski, and I work on strategy at HuffPost, and I'll be facilitating things today. Uh, to get a better idea of where, what you're interested in discussing, we're going to kick it off with a poll. Uh, and this one is basically basing on the topics that we want Dr. Becky to cover today. So if we can launch that poll, topics are one, talking calmly to my kids about going back each day, signs my kids are anxious, three, how to talk about the emotional side of leaving again, and four, how to help mitigate separation anxiety. So while that poll runs, I'd like to share a few important notes about tonight's event. We wanna make this as interactive as possible. So if you can start your video so we can all see one another. And if you have a question you'd like to ask Dr. Becky, all you have to do is raise your virtual hand. You can do that by clicking participants at the bottom of your screen, and then you'll see a panel open up on the right with a raise hand option. If you're on a mobile device, click the more button at the bottom of your screen and select raise hand. You can start raising your hand as soon as you can, um, and we'll try to get to your question. And when it's your turn, I'll unmute you and call you up live. And if you have any technical issues, feel free to reach out to our HuffPost moderators. They're labeled moderators and they all have pink and green backgrounds, so they're easy to spot. And one last thing uh, before I take it all to Kate, uh, if you'd like to support our journalism, think about joining HuffPost membership. Uh, you'll get access to our comment section and invites to our virtual events like this one. Plus you'll get the option to join our exclusive members only newsletter called Self Care is Good Parenting. Well, that's all for me for now. Um, I'm going to pass it off to my lovely colleague, Kate Aletta. She's the Senior Editor of Culture and Parenting. He'll be leading this discussion. Kate, all you. Hi guys, um, I'm Kate Aletta, as Lauren said. I'm the Senior Editor for Culture and Parenting here at HuffPost. Um, I have been overseeing the parenting section for about two years now. And in my time doing that, I've put a real emphasis on helping parents raise emotionally intelligent kids, um, kids who are you know, resilient and um, resourceful and kind and empathetic. Um, it's something that I'm really passionate about. I'm a mom of two young boys. I have a soon to be second grader uh, who will who is going remote. I've decided today he's going remote um, and a preschooler. He's going to be in pre-K and he will also be remote. So God help me. Um, and um, I know from that decision uh, that the innate sense of fear and anxiety and worry that parents have, but I also know the fear and anxiety that kids have, which is why I'm so happy that we have Dr. Becky Kennedy here today. She is my favorite person on Instagram. Um, if you don't follow her, you must already. Her handle is being shared right now. Um, she is a clinical psychologist and a mom of three in New York City. And she um, does a lot of great work in terms of um, parent interparental interparent child relationships and helping nip problem behaviors in the bud. Her posts on whining and boo-boos and talking about empathy and all things have been my lifeline in the last six months. Um, so you have to follow her if you don't. Her big forte she can talk obviously for herself as well, but the thing that I love about her most is how she gives role-playing advice and she really actually gives you the words you can use with your children, which has been so clutch to me, um, especially during this pandemic. Um, so I know that parents have been seeing uh, their kids regress in a lot of ways since March. So I wanted to um, introduce Dr. Becky Kennedy and have her give a spiel for us. Um, we have another poll um, to launch as well about what you're seeing your kids um, how behavior seeing your kids of late too. So as Becky is introducing herself, we can pull up the second poll as well. But first, should we check in on the first poll? Probably. What is Let's the what are some of the answers from the first poll? Okay. So most of you want to know your signs that your kids are anxious. It seems completely fair to me. I'd love to know that too. Um, how do you talk to your kids calmly about going back each day? Uh, came in second with 48%, followed by how to talk about the emotional side of leaving again and how to help mitigate separation anxiety. Those are, um, the one thing we don't have in the poll that I think we should have had that I regret not including is about um, anxiety and homeschooling too. Um, we can talk about that as well, remote schooling, I should say. Um, so Dr. Beck, you'd like to do an introduction of yourself and that's great, take it away. Great, so thank you so much for having me. It's been really um, amazing, kind of all the people I've met through my Instagram journey. And Kate, you and I have had so many really kind of powerful um, 
deep conversations in the short time we've known each other. So I look forward to many more. So thank you for having me. So yeah, so just to tell you all a little bit about me and for any of you who are willing to put on your videos, I'm so used to doing so many of these talks you know, live. And I feel like I vibe off the energy. I can tell when I'm talking about something when I'm like, okay, people are not interested in this move on or okay. Give more about this. And so seeing you is so helpful. If you have some like face mask on, not like this, like white, whatever. And you're like, no one wants to see me. That's fine too. So no pressure, but thank you to all of you. Just turned it on. So yeah, I'm a clinical psychologist. I am trained in family and kind of child and adult kind of psychology and therapy. And I'm also a mom of three young kids. So my kids are eight, five, and three. And I always feel like there's two parts of me. There's Dr. Becky. That's mostly who you'll be hearing from. And then there's Becky, who is like the actual mom to her kids. And just so you know, the things that I'm going to be talking about or even saying, oh, say this or try this or do this. I myself do them some percentage of the time that's way far from a hundred, right? And in fact, at the end of most days, my husband <laughs> always says to me, he's like, you should read this like Dr. Becky at Home's post today. You may like really get a lot out of it based on what I heard you doing earlier with our kids. And sure enough, I'll like read my post and I'm like, oh, I should try that tomorrow. And then maybe I do and maybe I don't. So that's kind of how it goes in my home. So that's probably how it will go in your home home too. We never go for perfection here. Um, we're going for reflecting on new ideas, seeing what resonates with us as parents and trying it out and actually using how something new feels with our kids as a barometer, not whether it works, right? To me, that's like a big idea, but we, our kids' behavior should never be the barometer of our parenting and when, especially when we try something new. So with that in mind, I want to make today really like, useful, really concrete. We're going to take a lot of questions and get into the particulars of this transition. Um, and Kate, you tell me, do you want me to jump into kind of the poll, kind of some thoughts about that poll, or do you want to kind of start with the more? Yeah, we can start with the, the, the first poll. Sure, why not? So let's talk about the thing that came up a lot, which is like, how do I know if my kids are anxious? I'm going to take the liberty of reframing this for us all your kids are probably anxious. I'm just gonna say that, okay? And the reason I think that's true is that we're asking them to make a huge transition. Going back to school has just never meant what it does in 2020. We've been home with our kids. We've been quarantined with our kids. We've been in the midst of a pandemic with our kids. And in some form, we're about to say, separate from me and go do your work again, um, either literally in school, like goodbye, or actually in our home. But by the way, you're still doing school and I might be in the other room doing some work or doing my own thing. Please attend to your schoolwork. It's just different than it ever has been. And anxiety really is it's a state of discomfort, right? And so when I say your kids are anxious, I don't, I don't mean I think your kids all fit the you know, clinical diagnosis for anxiety. But I think the more useful thing is, is my kid sensing changes? Is my kid going to be going through a change? Am I asking my child to do something that's going to be difficult? And is it upcoming, something we're anticipating? And does my child sense that and maybe have feelings or worries about that? Right. And I'm a deep respecter of kids. I, I think very highly of kids and kids are evolutionarily designed to pick up on changes in their environment. It's how they learn to attach to their caregivers. It's how they learn to survive. Our kids notice when we skip a word in a book and get upset. So the idea that they're not having feelings about going back to school after a pandemic seems pretty unlikely. Right. So one of the things I often try to do is my, for myself as a parent and kind of pause after this thought and kind of get into some more questions is I often always try to take questions that have a yes, no answer and shift them. Cause I feel like whenever parents come to my office um, and ask a yes, no question, which is common, is my kid anxious? Is my kid gonna be messed up by this forever? I heard some pediatricians say that the lack of socialization is gonna affect my kid forever. Do you think that's true? And almost always, I just think a yes, no question, probably in life, but definitely with our kids, is just the wrong question to be asking. And I think a better question almost across the board is what is going on for my kid? And what does my kid need? And I think through the school transition, that's a question I can tell you I'm going to keep coming back to, especially when my kids are having a hard time. Oh, well, what's going on with my kid? I can just tell they're a little feisty. Their anxiety is probably coming out in one of two ways as externalizing. That's when our feelings come out. They're angry. They yell. They're fighting with their siblings. They're having tantrums. It's external. We're more internalizing. They're withdrawn. They seem really quiet. Maybe they can't sleep, right? Um, 
And it's probably coming out in one of those ways. And just as a parent, instead of saying, oh, is my kid anxious? What's going on for my kid? Well, my kid's probably feeling lots of things about an upcoming transition. And what does my kid need? And I think in the course of this talk, we're gonna talk about so many different things to give your kids. That is part of kind of answering that, what do they need question. Awesome. So we have, speaking of polls, we have another poll. Um, some of the things that I've noticed in my kids in the past six months are just, um, they never regressed in terms of potty training or um, anything, but they have been in our bed since March, mm -hmm. um, pretty much every night. Um, my two children were very, very clean at the beginning. Um, couldn't yeah. even go to the bathroom without one of them there with me. Um, and recently my younger son um, has been having tantrums over kind of small, seemingly small things. Yeah. So with that in mind, um, I wrote up another poll that I'd love to share with you guys too, is uh, what are some of the traits that you're seeing in your children that you think could be tied to going back to school? Um, and it wouldn't obviously have to be just these things, but this is sort of what um, I've been noticing a lot in the parenting world and had people talking about. Um, so I'm curious to know how that's manifested um, in your children as well. Um, the anger part, you know, for my older child, the anger part was really there like in June and July. I think once school was sort of ending or maybe even early June when he was still in school and it was still going on. And he was like, this is, we're still doing this remote thing. Um, he was really irritable and angry a lot. So um, I'd be curious to know um, what some people are seeing. But Becky, like what is, um, is there an age by age guide for sort of what, and this is, are, is there an age by age guide for what you should be looking in kids? Like are regressions for younger kids or they, does it, is there any kind of way you can decipher that or probably not? No, I, I, I think there's really not in term because I think all of these things exist at all stages, right? We talk about tantrums a lot. Adults have tantrums. I mean, we don't kick and scream usually in the same way, but you know, we, we yell at someone we don't want to yell at, right? We all have sleep issues. We all have anger. We all get clingy at times. So I think it's good to just tell yourself no matter what age my kid is at, he, she might be having any of these things, mm -hmm. right? And what I think is really important to remember is in a time of stress and change, it is adaptive for kids to be clingy and regress. It annoys us as parents because if there's anything I know as a parent, what I need is I need my kids to get away from me, definitely at night. It's just like, leave me alone. We've been with our kids nonstop. But what our kids often want when things feel different in the world, and this is just based on evolution, is when things feel different in their world, kids who are unable to survive on themselves say, where's my source of safety? And I better get closer to that source. I can't be away from that source of safety. This is who gives me protection, right? It's kind of back in the day, this was, I heard a rustle in the forest. Uh, maybe it's a bear. I'm going to run to my parent. And until a parent says, oh, look, we're going together. That's actually a squirrel. You're fine to go play again. I'm going to be, I'm going to be on my parent's side because I know as a five and eight-year-old, I'm not, I'm not fighting off a bear. There's no bears anymore, but the same, the same thing. I mean, there are, but probably not where we live. Um, but what, what our bears are right now is just things that feel odd and different. And this is probably, I think one of the most important things for anyone on this call is more than ever, what our kids need is an explanation of what is happening in their world and why they're going back to school or why they're going half and half or why they're having virtual school. They need an explanation. Clinginess and regression, especially, are a sign that my child feels unsafe. And I think one of the things and, I, and that the most well-meaning parents sometimes think about very differently than I think about is they think information scares kids. So many people in my practice said, oh, my kid's only three. I don't want it. coronavirus. He's three. Like, how does he know about coronavirus? I don't want to tell him about coronavirus. Or He's five. Yeah. I mean, me and his dad have been fighting a lot, but like, I don't want to bring him into my marital issues. He's so young. Right now, obviously th there's ways to say things and, you know, ways that are inappropriate. But the key idea is that Kids don't get scared by information. They get scared when they notice changes and they notice things around them that feel different and those things aren't explained to them. Information starts to fill that gap and helps them understand the world. It's kind of their way of saying, oh, it's a squirrel, it's not a bear. Oh, there's this thing called coronavirus. That's why people are wearing masks. Now everything actually makes sense. Before when I saw people covering their mouth and everyone standing away from each other in the grocery store, my body feels 
terrified, not knowing what's happening. But as soon as my parents explained to me that there's been a jumpy germ and that people have to stay away and you wear masks to keep the jumpy germs away and he left over, now I understand, right? To me, a buzzword that we all talk about and the keyword is regulation. And we all want our kids to have regulation. And if we want our kids to have something like regulation, we have to know where the pathway starts. And the pathway always starts with understanding. And for your kids who are especially going back to in-person school, the number one thing I would tell parents is you have to explain to them, you have to use the word coronavirus, explain what it is, and explain why it's now okay to go to school. And clinginess and regression start to get better the more you actually talk to your kids, not only about the clingy feelings, but actually just about what's happening in their world. Because so how do you do that then? Sorry, but how do you do that then? You're saying it's okay to go back in school now after six months of not, how do you, like, what would you say? Great. So I think it depends on the age, but I would actually say I would all, my kids all know the word coronavirus, right? My youngest one's always talking about coronavirus. Oh, we're doing this, but we can't cause a coronavirus. It's so affirming. So what I would say, my youngest kind of kid story is there's been a jumpy germ called coronavirus. You might've heard people say that around you, it's kind of a weird word, coronavirus, coronavirus. It's a new word. Here's the thing about it. It's a very jumpy germ, kind of like a cold, and it can jump from person to person. Mm -hmm. Doctors figure out is it can't jump from person to person when you're far away, and it can't jump from house to house. That is why, and that's a key phrase, that is why we've been in a house together. That's why we haven't gone to swim class. It's why we haven't seen grandma. And we needed to stay in our house because actually when you stay in your house, the jumpy germ is no one to jump to. And then it kind of goes away. And I want to be totally honest with you because I always tell you I'm going to be honest. It hasn't totally gone away, but there's a lot fewer of them. And we live in an area where there's so much fewer of them that we can start to go out again. And that's why it's safe to go to school now for you. That's why we decided it's good for you to go to school. One thing will be a little different or a couple things. You're going to wear a mask. Masks keep any leftover germs from away right? Masks protect us from any leftover germs that might be there. And schools will actually have classes that are smaller. So everyone isn't as close to each other. So there'll be masks, there'll be fewer kids, the teachers will be wearing masks. In a couple of days, we'll talk about some other changes, but that's the start. That's what's going on. What do you think about that? What do you think about that? Tell me. Now, a three-year-old is probably going to look at me and say, I mean, I think I want my pretzels, mom. Like, can you kind of right, move on? Right. And I think the mistake parents made is they're like, oh, my kid didn't understand that was a waste. No, my kid is processing, right? There's plenty of times my husband says something to me that's big. And I'm like, I don't say I want pretzels now, but I basically do. I'm like, you know what? I need to sleep on it. Okay. Like, let me, let me process this. Our kids don't say I need space to process. They say, can I have that snack or can I watch my TV mm -hmm. show? It's in there. It is deep in their bodies. Right. And with older kids, I think it's the same story, just probably without, I mean, with some playfulness because they're kids, but just really being direct, but then they have to understand why it's okay to leave. And if you feel like as a parent, I can't really give my kid a story that feels good for me and truthful for why it's okay to leave, then that's something we have to reconcile with. Because if we can't come up with the reason why we tell our kids, I actually think this is safe, we're putting a huge burden on them to try to go through separation at a time that we don't even think it's safe for them, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think the other version is, well, some kids will be going to school. And actually, one of the things our family decided is you're going to be staying home from school. Remember that whole jumpy germ thing? Well, so many of them have gone away. It's just tricky. Some parents feel like it's really a good decision for their kids to go to school in, in the building. And some parents think, you know, we're going to wait a little longer. There's no right way. Everyone's just trying to do the best. And the thing our family decided for us is to keep you home from school. It's kind of very straightforward very non-judgmental, um, and just kind of telling our kids how it is. So then just fast forwarding, presumably if people, if people who are in kids are going to school have to get pulled out again. Yes. How do you have that conversation? Great. So what I would say there, and, and you know, to older kids, especially, I would alert them to that possibility. Look, this is going to be a year of so many changes right now and where we live, we've determined it's safe enough to go to school. If some of those jumpy germs come back a little, it's gonna be back to that time when we're gonna have school at home. I'm not saying that because I know it's gonna happen, 
this is one of those years we just don't know so much. We're going to not know it together and you'll be the first person I tell. So I think you can say that mm -hmm. for a younger kid. I don't think a three, four year old needs to kind of be burdened with that. It's kind of a lot to manage. So what I would say if there's a closure is, and this is why it's so important to tell the first story. Remember when we talked about those jumpy germs and how we stayed in to make them go away. Now we're at a point where we have to do that again. There have been some more germs coming. And so all the kids and all the people are going to go back to their houses so we can make the germs go away again. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. We ever look at the, the first, the second poll's answers. No, let's see them. I think we should see that. That's interesting. Issues, yes. Mm -hmm. So what do sleep issues look like? And like, what are some of the things that people can, um, and I guess sleep issues, anger, you know, all, the other, besides yeah. their questions are all sort of split, but what are, what are some of the ways that you can work with your kids through those? Great. So to me, the key thing about sleep issues is that sleep issues are separation issues. That's all they are. And I'm not saying all they are to minimize it. Separation issues are big issues, but sleep is not its own category. Sleep is about separation because we're asking our kids to separate us often alone and almost always in a room in the dark for the longest period that they ever separate 12 hours, 10 hours, mm -hmm. whatever it is, right? That is an issue of separation and sleep issues that are happening now. And I actually think all the time, but especially now are a result of a kid essentially saying, I have no reason to believe mom that you're going to be here in the morning. Nothing in the world has stayed the same. I'm not saying that because I'm a bad mom or you've led me to think you're unstable, but literally everything in my world has changed. Everything I thought was going to go one way has not. And now you're telling me I'm supposed to say goodnight, sweet dreams and be alone in my room in the dark for 12 hours. Like I'm a smart kid. I like, I'm, I don't think so essentially. Mm -hmm. Right. No, look, that's, that is actually what I think is going on. I'm a parent myself, like you all know, there's nothing as infuriating as sleep issues. I mean, it is because that's the time of the day that we're done parenting. I'm like, I am so done with you. I need time for myself. I need time to be with my husband. I want time to be a wife and a friend and a person, not a mom, right? What I would say, sleep issues, we could talk about for hours, right? I'm actually probably going to, there's been a big request on my Instagram. Can you please host a webinar about sleep issues for toddlers? Cause it's so different than for babies. I'm not letting my, you know, I'm not doing cry it out or anything like that. What I would actually tell you all is that to work on sleep issues at night, we have to have a good week or so before we intervene with anything at night that we're working on separation issues during the day. We have to build new skills when our kids are calm before we expect kids to access those skills when they're scared. It's the same thing as an adult. When you're in a meeting with your boss and he, you know, tears, you know, your report up and makes you feel awful. And then is trying to teach you something new. No way. I mean, like there's no learning that happens when we're anxious and terrified. We're trying to recover. Same thing with our kids. We can't expect sleep strategies to work if we're not playing around with separation and clinginess during the day. Mm -hmm. So a couple things I'll give a preview to, and I can tell you all, I have two massive carousel posts. The thing about my Instagram is that it's very practical, but it's very dense. That's just my style. There's as Kate knows, there's a lot of information there. And if you put into a hashtag, Dr. Becky, Dr. Becky sleep, there's two, 10 slide carousel posts, one called sleep strategies, one, one sleep strategies, two, and sleep strategies, one is all things to do during the day. And, and the re I posted that a week before number two, because I even say like, we're not even talking about the night first, right? The number one thing I think as like a little strategy or game to start playing with your kids, and I would do this no matter what, even if your kids are doing virtual school, in-person school, have sleep issues, have clinginess, all of it. It's something I call the together all the time game. Okay. So here's how it would be. You have your daughter, um, Anna, okay. Who's very, very clingy and probably having sleep issues at night, right? During the day, the game would look like this when she's independent and actually not on you. Maybe she's playing with Play-Doh or whatever she's doing happily. My daughter, Anna, I would go up and I would grab her. Now, like not, not aggressively. And if she said, mommy, get off, of course I would get off, but like playfully I would hold her and I would say, me and you, Anna, we need to be together all the time. I'm never letting you go. Me and you together all the time. And I'm going to eat like this. And if it's me, I'll be like, I'm going to sit on the toilet with you. I'm going to pee like this. It's going to be so weird, but we just need to be together all the time. I'm never letting you go. You can't do anything without me. I'm really, really acting it out. At some point, every child goes, mom, like, let, let me go. I was doing Play-Doh. And at that point I doubled up. No, no. Okay. We'll do Play-Doh together. And it's awkward. And it's kind of silly and laughing. Mom, I'm doing Play-Doh. Let me go. Let me go. And at that point I can let her go. 
And what I'll say is something like, okay, sweetie, you know, even if I let you go, I know mommy and Anna always come back together. Okay, we can be apart for a little bit. That's like, I have the chills when I think about it. That's like the money. That's like the money moment. <laughs> what you're doing there, okay, is you're doing so many things internally for your daughter. Number one, when she's resisting you, you're allowing her to reaccess the part of her that does want to be a part of you, that can be apart from you. The one that's initiating separation, not initiating clinginess. The one that's saying, I'm good, leave me alone, right? And when you take the other role, right? It's a major role reversal. And then you can deliver the reassurance of how separation doesn't last forever, how separation always eventually leads to kind of return and reconnection. And that's a message a child can only hear, not when they're in a state of anxiety, but when they're in a state of safety and actually in the mode of wanting to be away from you. It's a total reversal with everything. My two younger ones were in major clinginess and sleep issues with like the start of all this kind of pandemic. And when I started doing with this, I'm not joking. I, I probably played this game 30 times in a row. Can you do it again? Can you, mom, can you do it again? Can you do the together all the time game again? Can you do the, can you do the, we walk like this and we pee like this game? Still, my kids ask for it all the time. And I feel deep down what our kid is really asking for is, I know I need to reaccess the part of me that can be independent. Please help me do that. Now, if you do that, am I going to get emails from you? That's like, oh my God, Becky, that night my kids slept through the night. It was amazing. No, it won't happen. I just want to own that. That It doesn't work that cleanly. But you're working on the circuit that is eventually going to lead to your kid feeling safe enough to separate, including at night. Interesting. Huh. So yeah, I'll say before we move on from sleep, just because I think it's a good one too, is especially as we make this next transition, something I did as we went into this transition with my kid is just creating like a big things that have stayed the same and things that have changed list. Going back to that original idea, regulation comes from understanding. It doesn't come from resolution. I've actually never said that before. That sounded, I like, like that. I'm like, like. <laughs> um, it, it does, right? It comes from understanding. And I think we often think we need to resolve things for kids. We often even wait to tell them information until we think we have a resolution or a silver lining. Mm -hmm. It's really bad practice for kids. As we know from adults, even living through this period, the hardest thing in life is finding our resilience when you don't have the answers. And if you can wire a kid for anything when they become an adult, it's being able to find their own feet and stay regulated when they're in a hard time. Not when they get out of the hard time, but when they're just in it. That's going to be a really gritty, right, kid. That's interesting. Um, and so for now, what does that look like, right? So something I did all the time and I'll probably start doing again as my kids transition for school is just literally an ongoing list in our kitchen. Kids love when you write things down. I don't know if you guys have read Siblings Without Rivalry, How to Talk So Your Kids Will Listen, Listen So Your Kids Will Talk, kind of the first parenting books ever written, probably not ever, but in like the 80s, they're like the best books ever. They talk all about this, about when you write something down that someone says, it's like the ultimate way to show that you really respect and are attending to them. Right. So I have this you list, things that have changed this, things that have stayed the same. Oh, mommy still reads me two books before bed. That's on the same list. Things that have changed in the beginning, right? Oh, I'm not going to school in the building. Oh, I'm not seeing grandma right now. I'm not going to swim class. Something that stays the same. We still have pizza every Friday night, right? You don't have to make the same list longer than the change list. That's not better. You don't have to make it equal. But related to sleep, something I said, especially in the beginning, every single day to my kids, is I'd say, you know what else stays the same? Every single night when you go to bed, mommy's going to go to bed in the same house. And every single morning when you wake up, mommy's going to be here. Sometimes so many things have changed that we forget that. I want to make sure that's on the list. And it got to a point with my kids where I'd be like, you know what else stay the same? They're like, mom, I know I go to sleep. You go to sleep. I wake up. You're going to be here. I got it. And, and, and I'm like, you know what though? I I still think it's really important to write down. I'm still going to write that down. But again, similar to that together all the time game, by the time my kids got so annoyed that they were repeating it back to me in that kind of annoyed tone, mm -hmm. I actually just knew, oh, that they've kind of internalized that stability. I'll take the annoyance all day. Right. That you get that I'm constant. That makes sense. Um, and I have one more question just before, yeah. um, before we throw it to live questions, but um, how do you separate... Um, for people who are keeping their kids remote, how do you separate, you know, the teacher role, the parent role, um, and, and make sure that the anxiety levels don't, you know, that your anxiety and their anxiety isn't like off the charts when you were dealing with so many different hats again, after presumably a summer where you were not doing that? 
Yeah. So look, I, I think number one, virtual school is going to be harder than going to regular school. I think that, that's not a reason to go to regular school. I just think we have to set our, it's, it's not at all. It's not a reason not to, it's just we have to set our expectations. Having our kids home and trying to be their teachers and their parents when we never initially wanted to be homeschool teachers, if that's your situation, is just really, really hard. And I think there's just a couple key things to keep in mind. And I'll do some concrete things and then some general thoughts. Number one, their work area has to be visually different from their home area. And if you live in a small apartment and you're like, well, they're working at my kitchen table, that's fine. But they should have a desk mat and a set of colored pencils and a sign that says Anna's second grade class that you put up on the wall, all of that only when she's in school. And as soon as it's done, it all comes down. Like there has to be a cue to help a child understand. This is why kids in school have charts and they have like they have so many visual cues, right? So number one, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Number two, think about the transition into school. You can't go from like eating a toasted bagel to teaching, helping your kids do virtual school or teaching them. You, you just can't. So for me and my family, we've long used, I don't know, if, there's this thing called, the, I can send you the link, like the mindful kids kind of activity cards that are they're on Amazon. There's a million different ones, which is essentially mindfulness to kids for kids. And we mm -hmm. always, when we did virtual school in the spring, breakfast was over, we did one of those and then they went to school. And like, you just get into a cadence, like you have breakfast and then there's a marker and then there's the sign on the wall saying their room. We have to emulate some type of routine. Now, a larger point, I think, is just, I think we need hard to try to be teacher or quasi-teacher and parent, right? Can you play around with that? Can you have a different outfit? You, you want your kids to call you something different when you're in that mode? Totally. And I think that's helpful. But I think the number one thing to keep in mind is that coming out of a pandemic, our kids are going to remember how their family homes felt more than any other factor. And not only will they remember that, that is going to be the biggest factor in their resilience. It's not going to be the kid who, you know, learned to go a couple levels ahead in reading. It's not going to be the kid who finished all the math homework. It's going to be the kid who said, you know what I remember? Once in a while, my mom said, forget school today. We need to do something funny. This is just too hard. Or who said, you know what? You're having a hard time right now. Let's take a break. And I trust you to come back to this problem when you're ready. Mm -hmm. Those kids, resilience is about feeling supported in hard times. And that has to do with our emotional support, not our academics. As a follow-up, if you're looking for more information, I have an IGTV on my Instagram from probably back in April that's called Parents Stop Teaching Academics, Start Teaching Resilience. And it actually goes through almost like a step-by-step -step method to help deal with your kids' resistance or their perfectionism or their I can't do it. Um, that actually is kind of really based in the way I work as a therapist, where kind of teaching them to kind of relate to that part of them as the part um, versus as like all of them in the moment. Um, and that will become that, that idea will become more concrete and clear if you check out that video. Awesome. Lauren, do you want to see if we have any live questions to yeah, start asking? Actually, yeah. And before awesome. I do, I just want to remind folks that uh, if you have a question to ask, just uh, click participants and then click the raise hand icon and we'll get to your question. But we already have someone with the raised hand. Uh, so I'm going to unmute you, Larisa Carson. Um, if you want to state uh, where you're from and uh, state your question. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. Um, Becky, thank you. Your insight is so appreciated. And, uh, you know, we're all, uh, I like to think we're all in this together. Um, but I, I had a question. I have uh, older kids, so mine are 12 and nine. Mm -hmm. And I hear you, you know, you covered a lot of ground here. Um, but I, thought I was wondering if we could have an opportunity to talk about what stress looks like or anxiety looks like for the older kids. Um, and, you know, one thing I'm struggling with right now is trying to uh, close the perception of disparity um, with our, our school district has allowed us to have options. So we can either do hybrid or we can do distance learning only. Our family is doing distance learning only. And I think that there is a, um, there's some divisiveness hmm. with that, um, unfortunately, and some sense of, or perception of disparity. And I kind of like some advice on how to walk through that with my girls yeah. um, and, and identify anxiety for that age group. 
And just as a follow-up to that, like when you say disparity, do you mean um, like my kids are going to be upset that they're not going to school and other kids are? Or do you? Yep. Do- yeah, that's exactly. And um, and and here's a tricky thing too. And I, I want to be very careful posing this, but I think that there is some perception that I, I don't want them to feel like we're ostracizing the families that have chosen to hybrid yeah. or that they are any less risk averse or that there's differences between our families and their families. Yeah. Um, right now I'm sensing, you know, well, I want to be careful to go to the playground outside because I don't want to run into any families that are doing hybrid. So mm-hmm. I, there's, there's this sense and I don't know how to approach that with them. Great. I think it's a great, great topic. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So in our older kids, what does stress and anxiety look like? I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer in a short time because it can look like a lot of things, but I think it's fair to say that when your kids are being difficult or withdrawn right now, it's probably a result of their stress and anxiety about this. So they're talking back, they're being rude. They're not listening. They're not doing the things they would usually do. Or maybe on the other side, they are less interested in their peers. They kind of, yeah, they're clingy to you and they're, they're more, you know, they want to be around you more. They feel a little younger. They feel a little withdrawn. Um, they're not as motivated to do the things they might usually do. Hey, do you want to go play soccer? It's a nice day. No, not really. Just kind of just going to chill or, you know, they just want to be in their screens all the time because that's just totally mindless, right? And they don't have to actually engage in anything. So I think it'll look like that. Um, I recommend number one kind of intervene as just a start when any of that's happening is to the more withdrawn side, right? Teens especially, but really anyone, but they don't like being told anything about them too directly. And they, right. If you, if you kind of go for the jugular, they're just like, you're done, you know? And so there's a couple ways around that. You can kind of just pose general ideas or you can say what you think's going on and then literally backtrack right away. And those are like, and I actually think for some young kids also, who have big feelings, who hate talking about feelings, these same things are true for them. I have a kid like that. So what do I mean? I would probably say stuff around those kids, like just thinking there's so many changes. There's just so many changes. It feels so hard. I wonder, I don't know. I just wonder if that's going on for you. I don't know if you want to talk about that or not. I'm just wondering. I don't know. Anyway, what do you think we should have for dinner? Like I'm kind of just putting it out there. A different way I would do it, kind of similar is, look, we're not going to do iPads and we're not going to do iPads right now, at least. And I feel like there's just been a lot of iPad, 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 nothing else feels that fun. I'm not saying that to be critical, sweetie. I just think it's kind of a hard time to be a 12 year old, right? With everything going on. I just think it's really hard. And if you ever want to talk about that, I don't know. I don't know. Sometimes mom just says weird things. I don't know. Maybe that's like the weirdest thing you ever heard me say. Like literally, like I'm walking it back kids are so much more likely after that to be like, wait, what'd you say? What do you think it's like to be a 12 year old? Like so much more likely to engage. The other side, I think is really true too. For those of you who have 12 year olds, 15 year olds, five year olds who are in the kind of tantrum or I hate you or kind of it's more externalizing. I think it's equally as important for these kids. To me, one of the key things about being a parent is being able to differentiate behaviors from feelings. I actually think it's one of the key things being human, like in any relationship. Can I see someone's feelings under their difficult behavior? And can I actually, after I've determined I'm safe in a relationship, prioritize the truth of the feelings over the truth of the behavior? Because the behavior is in some ways just a tip of the iceberg for the bigger feeling. So I think that involves a lot of time saying to things to angsty kids like, wow, that was a rude tone. And I actually need a deep breath to catch myself for a second. But you must be really upset about something. Talk to me that way. And in this family, we always care more about how people are feeling than how a particular feeling happens to come out of your body. So I want to like take a deep breath. You probably need to also, I know you're probably upset about more than just what I serve for dinner. And I care about all that. And there's a lot going on and, you know, let's come together and figure it out. Right. So that, that, that that's on that end. Now, in terms of more concretely, your question about, um, the disparity. I think it's, it's a really, really good question. And I'm going to give you some concrete language I would use, but I think it's also part of a general point. Our feelings never need to be made to feel better. It's just like the biggest misconception I think about feelings. I sometimes imagine feelings as like little people inside you, just like you are getting us all wrong. Like it's, it's all wrong. Someone write that someone announced like feelings are meant for feeling. They're just meant to be felt. And the reason feelings are hard 
is because you feel overwhelmed by them because you're alone. And if someone would just sit with you in it, but that's all we want, then I can feel the feeling and it's going to be okay. I don't want to be made to feel better. That, that, that's not the goal of a feeling. And I think that's really relevant all over the place, right? Because it comes up with this example, like number one, yeah, some of your friends are going back to school. And look, I can tell you all the reasons we made a different decision, but I actually don't want to get that into, into that right now. Not because I don't think you deserve an explanation. I think you do, but I think before an explanation, you deserve me to just acknowledge that it kind of sucks maybe to be in the family that decided to keep you home. And no amount of logic is going to take that away. And I don't want you to think it's going to take you away. We decided that this is what's best for our family, but you're really allowed to feel like that's really annoying and jealous of the kids who are going and wishing that you were included. And I, I, I care about the fact that you're feeling that way. And it's okay. And, and I get it. And I, and I want to, and I want this to just be the first of many conversations we're going to have about that. I think that is so key. And I think as an adult, the reason so many, I, I see so many of you nodding is because we just know the feeling of someone trying to logic us out of our feeling and how bad it feels. They're like, well, I didn't know you'd want to be invited to that lunch. It's like, just say, I'm sorry you felt left out. Like that, that's all you wish you were invited. Like don't use logic. It just feels awful. We're not in a court of law and our feelings are different than our logic system. One's not better or worse. They're just different systems. And so it's actually really powerful as a parent to me. This is actually, I actually think about family systems as people having roles and a parent's job or role is to kind of decide on kind of tricky decisions and also to validate your kids' feelings. Those are, and, and, and they work in tandem with the kids' job being to express their feelings. That's literally their job and like to figure out how to be a person. So, okay, so if I think about that, so I decided, or me and my partner decided we feel most comfortable with virtual school. My kid is upset. I guess that's they're doing their job. Their job isn't to like agree with my decision. Their job is to let me know how they feel. And now I have that part B of my job, which is validating their feeling. And then we go back and forth. And there becomes a powerful moment often, which I think is like literally the best life lesson where in my own families or families I've worked with, people are like, and the kid even says, oh, you get why I'm so upset. So that means you'll change your mind and send me back to school. And you have the opportunity to say, no, 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 I'm not saying that, sweetie. I'm saying two things are true. I'm the parent and part of my job is to make tricky decisions. And one of those tricky decisions is we think it's best for you to stay home. The other thing that's equally true is you're really upset about that and you're allowed to, you're allowed to feel that way. One is not going to dictate the other. They're, they're just both true, sweetie. And that's just really hard to sit with and there's no quick resolution, but I, I get why you're upset. Yeah. Right. And to me, that's the essence of like healthy relationships is like a model that you want to be able to, I want my kid one day to be able to both hold on to something feels right for me. And also someone feels something else and I can validate that, but I can still locate myself. That's like so powerful. And so I would really emphasize that. Now, in terms of the other outward judgments, something I think right now is really important to say is all parents are actually doing the same thing. All parents, we are all trying to make decisions that feel as good as a decision could make in the midst of a really tricky time. And we're all trying to make decisions in this kind of new time when no one knows what the right thing is to do. And there probably is no right thing. And we're actually all doing the same thing. Me and your friend, the one who's going to school, her and her parents, and we're, we're actually doing the same thing. We happen to end up at different places. But if you think about actually all the time you've put in and all the thought and our goal, we've probably done so much more of the same thing then we've done the different thing. The different thing is just the outcome. And I would even say that to your kid. I think it's really important as a family that we honor other people's decisions, but but we don't judge them because we're all kind of in the same boat. Thanks, Becky. And thanks, Larisa, for that question. We have lots of questions to get to, so we're gonna get right to it. Uh, Christina, you're up next. Let us know where you are from and state your question. I'm going to unmute you right now. Oh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this. It's been so so eye-opening to say the least. Um, our question was about, oh sorry, from um, Pasadena, California. So hello from the West Coast. Um, the question was about sleep, to go back to sleep. Um, we're not sure if um, our sleep issues with our daughter who's seven um, is about the cleanliness, but we co-sleep and yet she still has trouble sleeping. So we're not sure if, if it's the cleanliness or I don't know if there's anything you could elaborate on that point. So 
like I, 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 I think I wish I could give you like a simple sleep solution. I don't think I can, but what I think with sleep is yes. I think when you think about sleep as separation, that a child who has trouble separating saying, I, I, I don't feel safe right now, but also I'm not, I'm not, it's not familiar. So a child who's gotten used to sleeping with a parent, right. Also is just going to have a hard time starting a new pattern. And I think when the trickiest thing is pat parents is to figure out when is my kid really need something from me because they're truly terrified. And when is my kid uncomfortable, not terrified, but uncomfortable because they're doing something new. And then they actually need me yes to kind of be there, but also to tolerate a little bit of their discomfort so they can start a new pattern. And I think the thing with sleep and co-sleeping is it's often the parent when you say, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's as good a reason as anything to make a change. Now, if you're as a parent or like, you know what, I kind of like this. It's fine. That's fine too. I really believe there's no right way. But if you're at the point with your daughter where you feel like, you know, I just feel like this isn't right anymore, then there really are ways to slowly start changing it. And I go over this in that sleep strategies too, but to, as a little preview is kids who really have trouble sleeping independently really need their parents in their room. And I would think about not doing cold turkey, but if they're used to in your room, you, they, you, the first night they're in their bed and you're laying in the bed next to them. Three nights later, you're touching the bed, but you're not laying in it. Three nights later, you're touching the bedpost. Three nights later, you're at the wall near the bed, but not totally out. You're literally slowly walking out and building. If you think about it, they're used to sleeping like this. I'm a visual person. They're used to sleeping like this. If you want them to sleep, now you're a little further. Now you're a little further and you build it up. At each point you distance, you're going to get pushback. It's that change. That first night is always hard. And what's so important is to differentiate. What does my kid want, but what do they need? Those are different. They might want me to come closer, but as a parent, if I can say, you know what? My, my kid is here. They want me in the bed laying. I know that my kid isn't terrified. She wants me in the bed, but I'm literally touching the bed. Like I can rest assured. I don't think I'm terrorizing my kid. I'm right here. So I need to actually say to my kid, no, I'm not getting in bed tonight. I'm not saying that because I'm mean. I'm not saying that because I don't love you. I'm saying, because I know you can do this. I'm not leaving either. I'm here. I'm right here. And we're going to get through this. Our kids need that sturdy leadership. And when they're anxious, they need to feel our confidence. Great. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, we're going to get to Carrie Anderson next. You are unmuted. Hey, sorry. Um, hey, I'm from Atlanta and I have eight and six year old girls. And my question is about siblings. So we are doing virtual learning. We've done that since March. Our district is entirely virtual for the fall. And my kids like are driving each other crazy because they only have each other. And I'm trying to encourage that I'm so grateful they have each other, but they're just very different kids. And I'm wondering if they're, if you have suggestions to for me to act differently, to pivot their relationship so that they're allies instead of just going crazy because that's literally the person they've seen for six months. Yes. So sibling dynamics, again, like I, I love talking about siblings and um, I will plug a book that's not mine. Siblings Without Rivalry is like the best book ever written about siblings. Um, I get no money from recommending that. I'm just purely telling you all. It's taught me so much. So everyone should read that. I second that. It's great. It's amazing. Write um, it down. So having siblings is just, having a sibling is really hard. And I think number one is a parent. That's a really important expectation every day. It is not the same as having a cousin. It is not the same thing as having a friend. At the end of the day, siblings really are competing for scarce resources, which is your time and attention and love. And I have three kids and, you know, parents are like, oh, I love all my kids. I have, my heart expands every time. It doesn't, it's just not true. Not to say I don't love all my kids, but you know what? The more kids I have, the less individual time I have for each of them, that's just a reality. And I think there's something to figuring that out that's resilient for kids. I have three kids for a reason, but we have to honor that sibling relationships are tough. To get along with someone who is in some ways a rival is just tricky, right? So that's number one. Number two, I would say, I think the number one thing I help, I help parents do in my practice related to siblings is to number one, set the goal of, I will not be the resolver of my kids' arguments. Like almost never, 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 I will never do that. It's the biggest thing to get them to keep fighting because it shows them in a way, I don't believe you guys can solve this on your own. And mom is going to come and kind of figure this out for us. 
Now, what we can do instead of that is something so much more powerful, which is to make it a goal when your kids argue of slowing things down. That seems like a weird goal, but that's the only goal. The goal when our kids argue is to help them regulate. When we're regulated, we make really good decisions as humans. Same thing as an adult. When you're arguing with your spouse, there should be no resolution. You don't need someone to come in and say, oh, actually she's right this time and he's right or whatever it is. No, you need to regulate your bodies and get calmer. And from there, couples can always kind of figure something out. So if I walk through a situation where I walk in and my, you know, my kids, um, Alex and Bobby are throwing blocks or whatever is happening, a resolution would be like, what happened? You threw that block? No, like give him back the block. I'm going back to work now. Can you guys ever get along? That's number one a couple things. Number one, I'm solving it. The other thing to keep in mind is remember that our kids pick up on the version of themselves. We reflect back to them. Every time we say to our kids, you guys are always fighting. They're always fighting. All right. Every time we say, why can't, why are you so selfish? Why can't you share like your brother does? We are reinforcing that role. That is so powerful. So going back to the sibling argument, what is slowing it down look like? I say, whoa, 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 whoa. I would, I always start in my house, a lot going on in here. So many important things happening big feelings here. There's so much important stuff. I want to hear about all of it. We got to figure this out. And what I'm doing, even as I come in is I'm almost even through my tone and my pace, I'm starting to slow things down. Now, might I also take the block from my son's hand? If I think it's just the point of grabbing sure. I'm saying I'm taking this for now, not because anyone's in trouble because we have to slow everything down to figure out what's happening. He took it. He did it. I'm not listening right now. I'm not listening. I'm not going to come in here and tell you who's right. I'm not doing that anymore. That's a change. I'm not going to do it because you guys have the capacity to figure that out. And then what I'd walk them through is something like this. Alex, I'm going to hear from you first. Yeah, yeah. You'll go first next time. Everyone's going to get to go first. Tell me what happened. Oh, you were building a castle and your brother said, it was stupid. He said, I didn't say that. I'm not, I'm not saying it was true. I'm just hearing you'll have your turn. Okay. That got you really upset. Okay. Now I just want to hear from your brother. Oh, you asked him if he could, if he could play with him. And he said, no. Hmm. Sounds to me like we have two kids who are pretty upset. Hmm. I wonder what we should do. By the time I get to that point, My kids are going to start regulating because I am modeling the calm for them and exuding it in the space that was absent from them in the first place. That's the core of the problem. The core of the problem isn't who should get the block. The core of the problem is my kids got dysregulated, right? Then what I'll do in my family, especially after I practice as well, is they're like, we don't know what to do. Hmm. You know, the truth is, I don't think I have any better ideas than you do. You guys are two kids with really good ideas. I'm remembering yesterday when you figured out we got to sit in the left side car seat, you know, whatever they, you guys figured that out. You guys are kids who really figure things out when you really want to. Hmm. I'm going to hold this block because I know you both want it and I'm not going to figure out who gets it back. And I know and when you guys figure it out, let me know. I'm going to walk out of this room and get some water. I totally, totally have faith that you guys are going to figure out a solution, right? Or a different version of that with younger kids. It's like, where's my problem solvers? Where? Are they? I know they're somewhere. I know, I know they're somewhere. Where are my problem solvers? They're somewhere. I can't even tell you how many families are like, I literally did that. And I was like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. But then my kids like literally came up with a solution and that's never happened before. Yeah, because our kids really need help regulating and finding their goodness. And when we slow things down and suggest their capability to solve, we really, really accomplish both. That's a little preview to that book. They talk about a lot of things. There's other things. There's making sure we don't put kids into rigid sibling roles. That's really important. Giving kids alone time one-on-one with us is the best thing we can do to help them get along with each other. Um, But hopefully that's a start. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for that question, Carrie. Uh, We are winding down. Last call for a live question. Just click participants and click the raise hand. Uh, We have a question from Lorena Quinones. Uh, She submitted a question ahead of time during pre-registration, and I believe she's also on this call. So hi, Lorena. Uh, From Arizona, uh, how do you recommend addressing children's anxiety when with having to sit on a screen for hours on end? Our school district is planning to offer synchronous virtual learning, and this will be the first time my kids will be sitting with a class online for more than a 30-minute session. So look, I think... 
I think we're asking kids to do something that's developmentally inappropriate. I mean, that's like my first honest answer. So I do. And yet it's being asked. So we're kind of in this, I mean, I think the world was asking parents to do something developmentally inappropriate, which is being home with our kids all day, right? With like, uh, you know, a ton of stress all around. And here we are, right? So uh, going back to that other idea that I think more important than a child's quote, success on Zoom is a child feeling supported in her home. And ironically, those two goals go together. If a child really feels supported and everything that's hard, that child's gonna be able to attend to the maximum amount she's developmentally capable of attending to. I, I will say that I think part of it is, I think kids are gonna need practice before it starts. So if you have a week or two before school starts, they can't go from like zero to a class. Right. There are all these little things like I know out school has all these kind of like small Zoom classes that they do. Like I know for my kids, I'm having them do those classes before virtual school. I don't want them to go from summer to school like they need a little transition. Something that we're going to practice is let's practice you being on your computer and mommy's going to pretend to be your teacher in the other room. We're getting up Zoom and I'm going to practice telling my kid, let's write your name. Right. Let's do this. And I'm even going to practice the moments where I'm going to say to my daughter, no, tell me you don't want to do it over Zoom. Be like, I don't want to do it. And then we're going to practice that thing where we take a deep breath with our hand on our heart and we say, this is hard and I can do hard things. This is hard and I can do hard things. And then let's see if you can just write one more letter. And I'll play around with my child. She'll be like, oh, I can write my whole name now. And I'll be like, no, 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 no. just write one. Don't, come on. You don't want to write any. Now you're writing, oh, no, no way. Give them a little kind of fuel. But we're going to practice that. Right. The, the other thing I think that's critical around this is if I think about going back to virtual learning in the spring, and I think something that was families take the first couple of weeks of virtual school and then they project for what that's going to mean the whole year. And then instead of responding to what's happening in front of you, kind of that question, what's going on for my child and what does he need right now? We respond to our child today, actually more based on the fear for the future then we respond based on what our child actually needs in the moment. And to me, that's actually the source of so many of our, me too, our bad parenting interventions. It's like, oh, is my kid never gonna share? They need to share today. Is my kid gonna always talk back to me? I need to punish them today. Like there are these ways we look forward and we miss opportunities in front of us. So to me, one of the best kind of a little script for your first couple of weeks of school when your kids are having trouble with Zoom is just saying to your kids, makes sense, it's hard, it's totally new makes sense you need a break right now. Your body's still getting used to being on screen for so long. You are going to keep being able to do longer and longer periods. This is your second day. Of course you're not there yet. It regulates you and it gets you out of future worry mode, but it gives your kid that positive narrative. To me, one of the what, what I saw in families that really made it really hard is right away, you have to stay on. You can't do that. No, you have all the other kids are doing it. Talk about setting your kid up for months of Zoom anxiety and failure. We wanna get our kid the opposite message, right? I know something, I have two very different older kids. My first kid is like easy breezy. He's like, yeah, yeah, like, and he's older, Zoom, fine. My second kid hates being on camera, hates having pictures taken, so forget Zoom, it's like the worst. Right away, she's like, I'm not putting the camera on. There's so many kids who are gonna say, I'm not putting the camera on. Please hear me, the one answer, fine. I'm so glad you know what parts of Zoom make you comfortable, and what make you uncomfortable? Of course we can do Zoom without the camera on. You can still listen to your teacher and maybe even adding, you know what? There might be a day you feel comfortable or a moment you feel comfortable showing up and there might not, only you are going to know. Kids who are told that early on, not like the goal is to have them show their face, but if the goal is to get them to be more engaged, 100% more likely to engage that way than forcing them to sit with the camera on and having a power struggle. My daughter had the camera off for like a month and literally sat behind the iPad. She didn't trust that the camera was off. She had to sit behind the iPad with the camera off. Then she sat in front of the iPad with the camera off. And then once in a while, she'd pop in and say hi to all of her classmates, like amazement. She kind of cultivated this, you know, mysterious student persona, which seemed to work for her. That's how she wanted to engage in Zoom right? She's five. So I would say in terms of their like anxiety and our anxiety around it, number one, prepare, practice, practice being on Zoom, practice having a hard time in advance, give them a mantra, give them a tool. And when they have a hard time, remember what's going on right now. This is new. What do they need? They need my slowness. They need my empathy. And they also probably need me to reflect to them the belief that they're going to figure this out 
and that they're not kind of static in this moment. Great. Thank you so much, Becky, and thank you uh, for that question. We have another question uh, from Angela Morales. I'm going to unmute you right now and you can ask your question. Let us know where you're from too. Uh, hello, um, I'm from Vermont, uh, Northeast Kingdom, Vermont. Um, so my question is more of uh, the physical things that are going along with this. I mean, my child is 14. Um, they're not neurotypical already have anxiety. All of this is literally crazy making. So when coronavirus forced the kids out of school, it was actually kind of a happy week where they didn't have to worry about being around other people, having a meltdown, needing to fidget because of all the anxiety that was happening. So now going back to hybrid model that we're going to do in our district, what are the things that I'm going to be needing to address more? Spinning in her chair, that helps her calm down. Getting up and moving around, is it gonna be a distraction? Maybe just having the camera off would fix it. But I'm worried about things like, I'm told not to have too much screen time. Yeah. A whole school day is a lot of screen time. Yeah. What The physical things having to do with this, that's, I guess that's more my anxiety than my students. <laughs> So um, I'm finding myself um, noting that I feel like I'm not gonna, I feel like I would need like much more information to be able to answer this in a really comprehensive way. That's gonna be really individually useful. So I'll caveat it that way. Um, and I, I formula to figure out what do you, there are kids who don't fall on screens in general and it really activates them. And yet here they are in virtual school. I don't have a great solution for that, except noticing week to week, what you're taking in the data, seeing how your, what your kid is doing, how they are hopefully consulting with professionals that are involved in a more day-to-day -day way. I think that's the, the, that's how you're going to kind of make week to week decisions. But what I will say for kids who are struggling and kids who have a hard time and kids who are anxious around their peers and kids who are different, that the thing that saves those kids is feeling like they have a parent who understands them. Like the thing, and like, there's all the things we can do is there the chairs, there's a fidget spinner. Those things are totally, I think, important to think about. But I think the backdrop is, is can I just tell my kid every day, this is a really hard time. So this is a hard transition. Going back to school, I know it's going to be hard. And there's all these different things we could talk about, sweetie, should we do this? Should we do this? But that's over here and over here is I just want to let you know that I, I know you're gonna work hard at this and, and I know there's gonna be moments that are difficult and I'm right there with you and you can talk to me about it and they're not too much for me and I can take it and we're gonna get through this and you're a really awesome kid. And I just like, yeah, I know I said that yesterday. I'm gonna say it again. Um, and I don't, I, I, I don't have all the answers, but I promise you, they'll support you as, as we don't have them together. Um, and that's what I can offer you. And I think kids like that need that probably even more than kind of the small solutions we can have for different concrete problems. Thanks, Angela, for that question. Uh, we had so many quest great questions tonight and it was such an awesome event. I've been taking lots of notes. I have a, a one and a half year old and I know that this will all be helpful for me in due time. So we really appreciate that. And uh, we're going to take one final poll um, and this one's on future events uh, like this one at HuffPost. So if we can launch that poll, we have uh, you know, sex and intimacy, open and monogamous relationships, holidays, self-care forums, discussion on the intersection of COVID-19 and the social justice movement, uh, media literacy and fact-checking workshop. And if you have another idea, you can uh, email us at support at HuffPost.com. So while that poll is running, uh, I just want to give uh, you a heads up that, to mark your calendars for our next parenting event. It's scheduled for September 15th, and it's all about raising an upstander. And that's free for HuffPost members. Uh, the basic membership at HuffPost gets you into the HuffPost community where you can comment on our stories, receive personal event invites and discounts and more. So uh, be on the lookout for that and you can check that out. And you can also, um, let's go check out the, the results of that, that poll right now, if we can. 
Okay, great. So uh, yeah, we see a lot of a lot of interest in self care forums at sixty three percent, and um, something about maybe sex and intimacy, uh, and as well as discussion on the intersection of COVID nineteen and social justice movement. We take your uh, thoughts and opinions seriously, so we'll be keeping that in mind as we plan our future events. I just want to uh, thank you all, um, you know, for all of the great questions, and of course, you can follow Becky on Instagram at Dr. Becky at Home. I've been doing that. I've been checking out all of her videos and great tips. I just want to say one last thank you to Kate and Dr. Becky Kennedy for a really great discussion. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Dr. Becky. Um, this I took three pages of notes. So um, <laughs> I, I, I'm i set for a little bit. But thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I'm glad you were here tonight. Thank you for having me. So nice to connect with all of you. Take it easy, everyone. <laughs>